um, because just, just in terms of being prepped for some of these distal tibia fractures, where oftentimes there's a distal fibula fracture. And I'm curious on how you guys approach the, uh, the combo. Uh, so you have this kind of distal third uh, tibia fracture, CT scan, actually kind of a medial malleolar non-displaced fracture instead of posterior malleolar uh, fracture, which uh, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have probably seen that before. I have not necessarily, most of the time I see it posteriorly. So I went ahead and fixed it with a couple of screws from medial to lateral initially, kind of like we talked about already, and then tried to get my guide wire passed. And I could get it passed, but I couldn't quite get a satisfactory reduction or what I felt like, what, what I liked. You know, I kept wanting to go into a little bit of varus and um, recurvatum. So I ended up going ahead and fixing the fibula in this case. And then I think through that lateral incision, it's been a minute, but through the lateral incision would then, you know, put a clamp on it using one of the smaller clamps, passing my guide rod and then fixing it uh, distally with uh, three screws in this case. But can you just talk about your approaches to this situation where you have a distal tibia fracture and a, fib a distal fibula fracture? And do you oftentimes find yourself fixing the fibula fracture? And if you do, when do you, what, what do you do first? Because I've heard both 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 trains of thought, both both camps. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll be quick about it. So if I think the fibula fibula will need, needs to be fixed um, in order to aid in my reduction. I do it right away because then it, it I want to make it easy for myself. Um, occasionally, though, if, I, if it's at the end of the case and I, I reduce the tibia easily, I put a nail down and I'm like, man, I'm not very happy with my screws distally. They're just, you know, poor bone. I will usually use something intramedullary through the fibula just for added fixation at the end. Um, I usually will not plate it because you're going to be off a little bit, right? Even if your nail looks good, you know, your reduction will be off. So, um, but I kind of use that. I, I fix it right away if I think it's going to help me reduce the fracture. Brandon, what do you, how do you, same yeah. thing? Yeah, essentially the same thing. I mean, I have two reasons I fix it. One, one is, as Jan said, if I think it's going to help me reduce the tibia, in particular, if the fibula is simple and the tibia is not, right, then by all means, go ahead and do fix the fibula first. It's going to help you with the tibia. And the other one is, of course, just don't miss the distal fibula fracture. That's part of a malalar injury, but just happens to have a tibia in it, right? Some people get you know, get lost in the weeds. You're like, oh, that's fibula fracture is part of a tibia fracture, and I can ignore it because it's part of a tibia fracture. And it's like, well, actually, they've got that you know, little non-displaced medial malalus, and that's because the, there's actually a rotational component to this injury, and they've got like a rotational ankle fracture. And you would never, of course, leave that fibula not fixed if the ankle joint was unstable. So... Those ones, of course, then you should uh, should fix as well. And then, of course, those ones I would, I, I, for the same reason, if it's going to help me with the tibia, I would fix the fibula first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing about this particular case is that ended up kind of finding, you know, probably should have recognized it before, but ended up having not only the distal tibia, the fibula, that medial malleolar component, but then had a couple of non-displaced fractures in the midfoot and then a proximal fibula fracture as well. So, to your point, there was definitely a rotational component. Uh, to it as well uh, with the whole the whole shebang, um, but uh, but yeah, I think some really good thoughts on on the management of these. Any other pearls you guys have when it comes to intramedullary nailing? Um, I, I think one of the big things that's you know we're always telling residents, and I think you just always got to be reminded the nail is not going to reduce the fracture or, or very rarely, so make sure it's reduced um, you know while reaming. And I think that's just, you know, just to emphasize that to everybody in the room to be paid, be paying attention to not only when you get it reduced, but as you're reaming the fracture, I think that's one of the key things to that's, uh, you know, people need to pay attention to that uh, during the case. Brandon, any other thoughts, Pearls, parting? Yeah, 100%. I think the other thing is, you know, the, uh, you should get, there's certain points of the case that are worth spending extra time on, Right. And those are, in, in, you know, usually in order the reduction and the starting point and then potentially the ending point of the nail, right? So there's certain parts it's like, okay, well, that, you know, that doesn't matter. Let's move, move on, you know, uh, residents spending lots of time on like exactly how fast the reamer is going and, and whether or not they're reaming the fracture and things like that. But it's worthwhile to just stop for a second and, and make sure that those other parts are right. Because in particular with a nail, right, if you don't get those parts exactly right, you can end up in a lot of trouble with your final reduction. Yeah. yeah. I think those are all really good points. And then one other thing is like when you're reaming, when you're doing nailing, 
you guys have the tourniquet down, right? I mean, that's probably worth calling out. You know, if you're the rep in the room and you notice the resident has the tourniquet up, speak up. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we know it's mainly a heat generation issue, right? So if you're, you know, if the tibia is too high or the reamers are dull or the reamers are going too fast, then that's going to generate more heat and can kill the tibia. Obviously, the thing that I would always do is just blame the reps for not having sharp reamers, of course, because <laughs> uh, it's not my fault, obviously. But uh, no, yeah, so those are the main things. Yeah, you can, and the reamers are what the reamers are, obviously, sometimes, especially, I'm usually the reason they're dull is from me, because I'm running them against drill bits and blocking screws yeah, and things like that. Say, it's all your blocking screws. Yeah, that's exactly right. But I mean, but they should have replaced it. It's not my fault. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, you got to make sure those things are, you're not generating too much heat inside the tibia, for sure. Heat necrosis. Yeah. And, and I think that's even more uh, relevant to having sharp reamers for the reps and, and everybody, the team that's there for young patients. Um, because like in older patients, you can, I mean, you almost don't have to ream, but uh, in young patients, uh, you know, with the, they have a lot more cortical bone and you can, you can really, there are case reports of people burning the tibia, basically causing uh, the bone necrosis. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's probably, it may be more common than we realize. To be quite honest, yeah. we get well, lucky. Thanks, thanks everybody for jumping on, Brandon. Thanks for jumping on. Uh, that was fun uh, conversation. I think there was a lot of really good pearls that were talked about and things that you should be able to take to your ORs. Uh, and just as you think about you know being ready for these cases, I'm sure we've missed different things. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out um, in the future, and then we'll work on getting uh, set up for our next uh, episode, hopefully early December before Christmas hits. I think we're going to cover. What do we say, Jan? Perineal tendons, ankle instability. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, Brandon said he's going to come as well. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> he, he wants a good seat at the uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas table. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll have popcorn. I'll listen to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right. You See you guys. Thanks. Take care. Bye.